Okay, we're back with uh, Stony Brook's very own uh, Crocodile Dundee, Paul Gignac. I'm Stephen Reiner from the School of Journalism. Uh, before we just uh, get back with Paul, I just wanted to say a couple of things. First of all, um, I want to give a big shout out to our uh, venue tonight, The Bench, uh, here at Stony Brook. And uh, let's, let's thank The Bench. Uh, and uh, remember, um, uh, generous tips to your wait staff would be most appreciated. And if it takes another beer to do that, so be it. So, there you go. Um, secondly, we're going to um, have some. We're going to have a question and answer period. Um, well, that sounds too formal. We're going to ask you guys to throw some questions at Paul at the end of the, our, our little conversation. So think of some questions you have for him. And of course, there's also going to be a little surprise uh, flash quiz at the end because we are coming from an academic institution, and uh, learning is, of course, part of this. So we're going to have a quiz. So. Um, I want to get back to the nitty-gritty of the real world, um, Paul. I obviously did some research on all this uh, before our conversation, uh, and you can't go very far on Google without um, learning of uh, a recent crocodile attack. Uh, one came up, uh, it was in Africa, a man crossing the river uh, to deliver some tomatoes to his village. He had, unfortunately for him, the tomatoes on top of his head. And the crocodile did not go after the tomatoes. The crocodile went after something that the man later described as his manhood. And he did lose his manhood in the crocodile attack. But wisely for him, he then dropped the tomatoes in the water, and the crocodile then went after the tomatoes. So. He lost his manhood and lost his tomatoes, but saved his life. <laughs> Serious stuff. Serious stuff. Serious stuff. These are dangerous creatures. Absolutely. And the, probably the best thing that that man did was throw his tomatoes away. These, these animals have a, all kinds of little tits on their jaws, and they're actually um, uh, pressure receptors. So when they're underwater, they can't see very well, but they can feel the water waves around them. So one reason they're really good at hunting in the water is that they feel fish swimming around them. This animal probably felt tomatoes falling in the water all around it and instinctively went after those instead of the man's manhood. Well, he got, well, well, he got the man's manhood. He just didn't go after the rest of the That's man. That's unfortunate. So. Uh, but crocodiles do kill people every year. They do. Um, they're a particularly big problem in Australia where there are, um, monthly, there are crocodile attacks still. Okay, now we talked about the bite force. Uh, so we, we had a very good educated guess on the difference between the bite force of the shark and crocodiles, but we want to try a couple of more. Um, the bite force of a wolf. Anyone want to hazard a guess? Now, we said the crocodile is... Uh, 4,000 pounds. 4,000 pounds. So it's the, it's the king of beasts. But what about a wolf? 200. 200. A wolf? 300. 300, not bad. A lion. A lion. King of the forest. 500. And yet, 1,600? Is that what somebody said back there? Uh, only 900. 900. Um, a hyena, which is a very, very feared creature. Now, I should, I should premise this with, these are, these are bone-cracking animals. They, they should be able to have a really high bite force. They're, they're the best we have among mammals to, to sort of represent us here against crocodiles. So w what do you think? A hyena. 1,500. Do I hear? No. <laughs> 1,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds. And lastly, people. Again, many dentists here should have, this should be easy. Bite force of the human being. 60. 60. 75. 150 to 200, actually. So, so not it, bad. We can really bite into things. Well done. Now, we are going to ask you at the end of the evening uh, another question related to that, but, but we'll get to that in a while. So crocodiles have very strange, very, very unique configurations. What else can you tell us about their extraordinary abilities and how they've developed? So one reason why they're um, uh, such a 
a great group is that because of the conservation we've done, we have a, a deep understanding of what's called their life history, of the way that they make a living. So we know that these small hatchling alligators are almost entirely insectivorous, meaning they insectivorous. like insectivorous. Meaning they like, to, they like to eat insects. They like to eat bugs. They bite bugs. They bite bugs. And they don't have a very high bite force. It's only about two and a half pounds. So you can get bit by a hatchling alligator, no problem. Uh, as they progress in body size, they move on to a new prey type. So then they start eating fish and then small frogs and uh, small lizards. And all the time, they're getting bigger, and so their bite forces are increasing as well. And importantly, their teeth are changing shape. And we're just learning that we used to think tooth shape didn't really matter in these animals. And it turns out it's really important for how they access these new prey types. They start out with very blade-like teeth, which is great if you're going to try to indent um, the uh, exoskeleton of an arthropod. Translation? <laughs> the shell of an insect. It's amazing what the translation gets you, right? Sure. As they get bigger, their teeth also get more bulbous. And this is important for uh, chomping on bone and turtle shells, which are a, a bone. Uh, is uh, this common to other animals? Only, only crocodilians. Only crocodilians. Yeah. So again, human being. We get, we, we're, we're born without teeth, we gotta eat baby food. We get our baby teeth, we eat a little bit harder food, they fall out, we get our grown up teeth. And at some point, two sets. two sets. That's all we get. And at some point, pretty much, you can eat at 15 or 16 what you could eat before exactly. you get implants or dentures. And so this is probably why, it's probably why hyenas only have a thousand pound bite force. If they break their adult teeth, they're done. They have no way to crack bones anymore. And so they probably can't generate bite forces that are as high as the teeth can, can handle. But the crocodile is always improving, it, it seems. Is. It, it, it breaks its teeth constantly, but it's no big deal because they just keep regrowing new teeth. Every five to seven months, a new tooth comes in in the place where the old one was. So they can break it constantly and their new teeth will show up. So they seem to generate bite forces that are right at the apex of where their teeth then break. And they're just genetically programmed to grow new teeth. Throughout their entire lives. Slows down as they get older, but on average, about 10% of alligators are missing or have broken teeth. Is there anything humans can do to grow new human teeth based upon what it could learn, what we could learn from crocodiles? Is there some strange genetic engineering in the future that might be able to, again, I'm just thinking of the, if the I, dental school If here. I knew the answer to that question, You'd be a I wealthy probably man. wouldn't tell you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, but it's possible. It's Anything possible. Is we, possible. We could understand um, more things about the way that dental systems work from studying lots of dental systems. So just like in humans, a tooth that has a root and a special ligament that holds the tooth root in place, we have that same thing in mammals. So there's a lot of similarities here between croc teeth and, and mammal teeth, our own teeth. And so things about the way that the teeth deal with these high forces may tell us something about the way that mammal and human teeth deal with high forces as well. Okay, so they keep on adapting. So at different parts of their lives, they have the ability to eat certain things. That's right. And as their body mass increases, as they move on, they get different sets of teeth, different power, and they start eating other things. And this goes on and on for how long? Eventually, they reach uh, large game mammals, so they're eating deer or taking boar. And so these are uh, very difficult kinds of prey to overpower because they're so massive. And they're difficult to process because they have thick bone. And these teeth becoming much more rounded allow them to absorb the stresses during feeding so that they can break the bone and not break their teeth as frequently. Without getting too grisly about this, sure. so let's say a crocodile takes down a large, deer. takes down a deer. How, how does it do it? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it swallow whole or does it masticate first and then take in pieces? What's the, what's the process? It, masticate, yes, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, it, it turns out, perhaps counterintuitively, they don't, they don't dismember their, their prey while they're alive, um, which is for the best. They drown them, actually. So uh, these are ambush predators. They're exceptionally good at, um, at surprising prey at the water's edge. They have very low profile skulls, as you can see. They're, they're very low in their overall uh, uh, profile, so that even in very shallow water, they are invisible uh, from the water surface. And so this sort of iconic National Geographic image of a Nile crocodile bursting out of the, the uh, uh, shallow water to capture a wildebeest, 
allows them then to, to seize the prey, and then they drag it into deeper water, and ultimately they drown their prey. So, they dr so, so, so the prey most often is dead before it's consumed. Yes. So there's something oddly humane about that. Something. Although drowning is not a wonderful death, but right. still. But they're not eating it alive. They're so when we, see, alive. when we see other pictures of lions and hyenas and they're ripping at each other while they're still alive, that doesn't go on with crocodiles. No, and uh, part of the reason is probably that they don't masticate and that they don't uh, have a lot of ability to manipulate their prey outside of what their jaws do. And so if they let the prey go, it will often get away. And so we'll often hear stories of alligator and crocodile attacks where people um, uh, gouge the eyes of the, of the crocodile or alligator or they sort of stuff their hand down its throat and its reaction is to let go and that's the cases where people are able to get away. So once they have a hold on their prey, they really don't like to let go. So the best they can do is to try to bring it into deep water and drown it. Okay, so number three tips for if any of us in this room are ever grabbed by a crocodile. Tell us, number go one. Go for the eyes. Go for the eyes. Um, don't zigzag, that, that doesn't work. <laughs> you heard this where you have to zigzag back and forth? No. And, and, and by doing that, you confuse the alligator. No, their, their body's moving zigzags, so you're really just helping it out. Run okay. straight, run Go for fast. the eyes. Um, and there are reports of people who, after having been bit, reach in and there's a flap that keeps water from going down their throats. Pulling that open will then flood their stomachs and they don't like that, so they let you go. So if you have the presence of mind to do that after the crocodile's got a hold of your leg, good luck. If you happen to be in the sewers of New York, this is a great thing to do. Okay, so Paul, your, your, your passion, your interest, uh, your really almost lifelong devotion to this, to this creature is not entirely intellectual, it's not entirely academic. You also see this, an understanding of crocodiles, alligators as a, as a way to communicate, as a way to talk about It's a vehicle, science. it's a vehicle for science. And that brings us back to how and why we're fascinated with these creatures and how you use it as a vehicle. Talk about that a little bit. So think about the things you remember from say elementary school. You can probably name several of the planets you can definitely name your favorite dinosaur. You're probably familiar with the idea that a meteorite uh, uh, drove them to extinction. Um, and if you're a kid today, you'd be totally comfortable with the idea that birds are, are living dinosaurs. And that's a sophisticated set of ideas. And so we use these animals to push forward our, our, our goal of having a scientifically literate society. And the idea being that people who are more informed, who can think critically, will be better citizens. Uh, and, and better able generally to contribute. And because these are charismatic animals that uh, lots of people uh, just that love and are interested in, they're a great vehicle for doing that. It turns out we can ask really legitimately important biological questions about them, which is a great bonus. And so we get to have both sides, both, uh, sides of the coin, good science and great charismatic animal. Now, just one thing sticks in my memory about these charismatic animals, this whole business about turning them upside down and rubbing their bellies puts them to sleep. True? Um, not really. <laughs> if you turn them over, they will be immobilized. Uh, but as so far as... So lesson number four is get them on their... Get them on their heads. Yeah, okay. turn them upside down. Rubbing their bellies doesn't really do anything. What I've been told by people who work on this is that there's a, a blood sinus in their head that becomes engorged with blood and it cr cr creates a dizzying effect. And so they're just sort of immobilized. They're, they're awake, but they don't really know what's going on. It's sort of like having vertigo. And so they don't respond to you in any way. The rubbing of your belly is just a nice trick, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem to have any effect. Right. Is there any food? Is there any, I mean, obviously, you know, they can be poisoned like any other creature, but is there any food that in the natural world that has an effect on them, that is a tra natural tranquilizer or anything like that? They eat everything. You will find, and people have found, tin cans, old boots, parts of tires in alligator and crocodile And stomachs. the old boots may just be a remnant of... <laughs> right. It's possible. Right. Um, they're, they're, they have fantastic immune systems, which may contribute to them being able to eat whatever they what want. What is the life expectancy? Uh, these animals are, the, the largest ones can get beyond 35 and 40 years. So they're very old animals. Um, there is research going on now that's trying to access their blood as antifungal and antibacterial agents because they exist in this uh, really terrible environment. They're in uh, slow-moving water that builds up lots of bacteria and infections uh, are, um, 
uh, easily acquired because these animals bite for social dominance, and so they'll bite off each other's limbs when they're trying to fight for mates, and that doesn't really seem to affect them. It turns out that they have natural agents in their blood that counteract the kinds of bacteria that are in these swamps. So they can live in real that are in these, breeding these grounds swamps. for problems. I was going to ask you about their social relationships. So sure. when males are, are fighting for the attention of a female, they're going to go at it. They're going to go at it. And they're going to bite. They, they bite their heads, they bite their bodies. Bite force isn't just a, 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 a gee whiz interesting sort of result. They use it for accessing prey and establishing their social relationships. And so animals that, individuals that can bite forcefully early will be the dominant males or the, or the dominant uh, of their group. And so for example, after even only a year, the size range between alligators uh, is twofold with those largest individuals being the same age as the smallest ones, probably ate more faster. And because they grow based on how much food they eat, they got bigger. They're now the socially dominant ones, and it snowballs. They get to push all the other ones out of the way and get the food first, and so they get to be the bigger ones faster. Are there any, are there any social relationships, or once the reproduction is done, and the, the, you know, the dominant male has done his job, they just go on their merry way and don't, and don't pay attention to one another. The male will go on his merry way and doesn't pay attention to anyone. There's actually uh, parental care, however. Females uh, care for their offspring for the first uh, almost a year or so. And so uh, they build nests, these very intricate nests that are a combination of uh, a, a hole dug in the ground and um, uh, leaves and foliage that ferment and so they control the temperature of the nest. And then when the gators hatch, they carry them in their mouths to the water's edge. They, they, they put them all in this 3,000 pound machine, killing machine and gently bring them back to the water. And then the- So even with those creatures, that maternal gentle the instinct, instinct is there. Is there. And, and certainly since we know that, that birds and crocodiles are related and in between them are dinosaurs, we think that dinosaurs had parental care as well. Uh, uh, just, you know, the other thing that I think, you know, we'd have to talk about a little bit, and this comes back to trying to, 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 to help foster a scientifically literate population, um, it is, is, is what has become the, the politically charged uh, area of evolution, right. subject of evolution. And as you said early on, as we talked about, one of the fascinating things about crocodiles, they are a living embodiment of evolution. They are a reminder of where the world once was. And talk a little bit about the importance of understanding the crocodile in the, in the larger picture of, of understanding evolution, and how, as you once said in another conversation we had, that you can even see evolution occur in a, in a Petri dish. <laughs> you can. It's, it's Evolution happens, it's a fact, it's, it's not disputed. What we are trying to understand are what are the patterns of evolution. So in a petri dish, we can cause bacteria to evolve the way we want to. But when we scale that up to big populations of animals, there's a, a randomness factor that we don't really understand yet. And so we can't, for example, predict the evolution that a, the group of animals is gonna undergo. But we're still trying to understand what the patterns are and the evolutionary processes that drove those changes. So we, we can't extrapolate based upon everything we know. We don't know what crocodiles are going to be like, look yeah. like, act like 5,000 years from now. We have a little bit of a clue because these animals, although they, they seem like they haven't changed in 200 million years, if, you, if we pulled out a, an ancestor from 200 million years ago, it would look almost identical to a crocodile today. Remarkable. I mean, that alone. Remarkable. It, what it represents is that they are exceptionally good at existing in the environment that they, they exploit. And so they, they, while they've changed a lot, it's actually been within a really narrow range of, of their anatomy. So they kind of bounce around like a pinball within this range of having really slender snouts or very broad snouts, having bulbous teeth or very narrow, sharp teeth. But they're limited to that. They can't seem to get out of it. And so we think they're going to stay limited to that as they move forward, um, but what they do in that space is not really clear. So they really are, from your estimation, a very, a very precious, valuable creature on the earth right now. Absolutely. In terms of what they, as just the living representation of so many 
hundreds of thousands of years. They, they represent an important animal for understanding the uh, impact of conservation. They represent an important animal for understanding uh, potentially impacts of uh, global climate change. They represent an animal uh, that we can access readily through the fossil record because they live in the environments that best preserve fossils, so uh, in waterbeds, um, at uh, lake shores, in uh, uh, places where ocean and rivers meet, where there's lots of, of sediment, lots of, of, of uh, sand being dropped. And so we have a great fossil record because they would, they would die and fossilize in these places. So we have a really super understanding of how that 200 million year change has taken place. So they're a good model for getting at these kinds of big picture questions. So the next time any of us are crossing a river or the next time any of us are face to face with an alligator or a crocodile, I hope we're going to look at them with a very, very fresh set of eyes, with new respect, uh, with new understanding, a fa fascinating creature. Um, I want to thank Paul for giving us an incredible window on the world of crocodiles. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. So let's thank Paul very much. Thank you. And um, I'm going to turn it over to our waitress, Danny. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? If you do, can I ask you to please come around back behind them and meet me up here? Anyone? Some people have questions. I saw some hands. That's terrific. Can you come up here, please? I think we vamp very well. We, we riff off each other. It worked. We know that dinosaurs are extinct, and the reason they were extinct is probably a meteor came down on Earth. And you, you know the, the whole thing. Why didn't the uh, alligators and the crocodiles become extinct? That's the $64,000 question. Uh, we don't know why some groups of animals passed through that extinction uh, unfazed. Birds are an example, uh, mammals made it through, crocs made it through, and lots of, of marine creatures. There are ideas out there, but no one's really pinned down yet why that's happened. We have had five major extinctions in our Earth's history, that's one of them, and in each case, some group of animals makes it through, and it's not really clear why that has happened. Also, we've had climate changes from drastic that's right. heat to drastic freezing. How do they stay alive in that it's the same answer uh it it seems to be in general that when global temperatures increase they get higher we get a big spike in the number of species uh, so there's a lot more evolution and that when uh, global temperatures cool we lose that diversity uh, so we we may see more evolution faster evolution with uh, increased global temperatures but it also comes at a risk the animals that are alive now aren't going to be well adapted to those hotter environments and they're going to go extinct. So the trade-off is we get newer, in, newer things we don't know what they are or we lose the things that we have now. Is that humans the same way? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. This is a question from the back of the room. All right. I'm just the messenger. Uh, it's a very good question though. Do they get cancer? Do they get cancer? So the, that's a great question. So yes, but not that I actually have any knowledge that there are alligators or crocodiles with cancer, but we see animals all over the animal kingdom get cancer. It seems to just be a side effect of having lots of cells make up your, your organs. And so when one of them goes haywire, you end up with cancer. You end up with a cell group that, that grows and grows forever. So there's no reason why they can't get it, but no one's looked at that as far as I know. So why do they die? How do they die? How do they die? No one eats them. They eat each other. They eat each other. Yeah, they're, they're not very nice to each other. So um, let's just eat that old man tonight? Is that kind of what it is? It, yeah. Uh, is that the leading cause of death? I mean, self uh, 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 cannibalism? Well, the, the leading cause of death would be in that first year where 80% of them uh, die No, but off. after the but, adult. But after that. Um, so the 30 year old crocodile, 25 year old crocodile, the life expectancy you said is 35 years. Right. Why does it die? Natural uh, causes? Eventually, or? eventually, it's going to have fought so many battles, it's going to be an old warrior and a. a 
younger but large crocodile or alligator will come into its territory and want that territory. Females respond to males that have really great parts of river systems. And if that old male can't defend that river system anymore, then the younger one's going to displace him and probably kill him in the process. So that is really a leading cause of death. They just kill each other off. They do. It's a violent at that, species. At that last, say, 5% that are left, right. the only thing they have to fear is each other. OK. One more question. One more question. So Paul, you've done a great job. And you told us a lot, but you haven't answered one question. What's that? How does a little boy grow up to become a champologist? Okay. Why and how do you possibly get involved in this? So how Thank you, young man. <laughs> <laughs> how do you how do you get here is a, a great question. Uh, I have I I am that five-year-old who just never let go of thinking that dinosaurs were really interesting and thinking that crocodiles were amazing. And so by the time I left elementary school, I knew I wanted to be a paleontologist. For the next 15 years, uh, I worked on getting myself there. And so that was volunteering at uh, science institutions. I, was, I worked at the Mystic Marine Life Aquarium in Connecticut. Um, I got involved with uh, the Jason Foundation for Education, which is run by the guy who discovered the Titanic, Dr. Ballard, uh, and uh, did a lot of science outreach even as a teenager. The idea was that you were a teenage ambassador for your, your peers of science. In high school, I focused on math and science classes and French and Latin, because as an anatomist, there's a lot of history of, uh, of French anatomists. And then by the time I got to college, uh, I was doing research at an undergraduate level that then uh, gave me access to doing research at the, um, the graduate level. And, and from there, it, it snowballs. Once you've shown that commitment, people respond to it. And uh, you end up being able to, as long as you're focused and you put your considerable efforts towards it, get as far as you want to. Great. I'll take one right. last question. Okay, I know how to age a fish. You look at the scales or the opicular bones. How do you age a, a, uh, a crocodile or alligator? That's a super question. They t put down growth rings in their bones just like a tree does. And so we're able to understand lots of things about the living ones and the fossil ones because we can figure out how populations were structured so that there were lots of young ones or lots of old ones and we know that because we cut up their bones and look at these growth rings. From the outside, you can't really tell. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, great. I think I lied. Great There's one more question. All right. <laughs> uh, so I grew up with alligators. Oh, yeah? um, I lived on a pond. And, and at one point, I thought I heard the mating call of a male alligator. Um, but it's hard for me to to make that sound. Can you make the sound? <laughs> <laughs> and if anybody rushes the table, we're really going to be really in a lot of trouble. Um, I've never actually tried the uh, male alligator call. The babies make these chirping sounds. Um, but when there is, a, there is a vocalization they make. So when uh, a male alligator is trying to attract a female, it has this very, this, uh, very guttural kind of a, a growl or a hiss. They don't have really substantial vocal systems at all, and so they don't make a kind of a call. Um, but they, they raise their backs in the water, and they sort of tilt their heads up, and they, they hiss really, really deeply. At the same time, they shake their backs. And apparently, female alligators find this really sexy. <laughs> and American alligators, uh, and probably other crocodiles, but no one's looked at this yet, are the only animals in the animal kingdom that can create what are called Faraday waves, standing waves in water. So that the waves don't ripple out. They just stay in one place. And it's because the scoots on their back shake so fast that the waves are in, in phase and, and cancel each other out. And they're the only animals that can do that. So they hiss and they make waves for their lady friends. <laughs> I have a second question, actually. Follow-up um, question. Uh, so I was hiking in the winter next to my pond, and I, uh, I scared the alligator, and he, he went off. And my mom said, he was in hibernation. You killed him. Is that true? <laughs> um, probably not. Uh, so. So these animals do hibernate. They actually um, build uh, these long passages uh, just under the water surface that go up into the banks. 
and it's a place that's slightly insulated, and so they can spend their winters there. But if it was an animal that was up and moving around, it wasn't hibernating yet. So, so, so you saved yourself lots of therapy, okay. not worrying about that guilt with Wait, killing that alligator. Where was the pond? Where was the pond? Um, it was in South Carolina, okay. in the Midlands. It's a 20-acre pond, only room for okay. one male, I think. Yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, next we're going to go to the pop quiz. We're going to go to the pop quiz. Wait, do they have harems? She said there was only one male. Do they have what? Harems. Um, not structured, but uh, a male will... A male will um, stake out a claim on a great piece of property, and then the, the female alligators will come and, and check it out, and if it's good enough, then he's good enough. There you go. <laughs> okay, now we get to some competition, pop quiz. Danny. I hope you are all paying attention, because I heard that if you get the question wrong, you have to wrestle an alligator, so, or a crocodile. So, the way it's gonna work is I'm gonna ask six questions, and if you think you know the answer, if you could just raise your hand and not just yell it. Um, I would answer the question if you got it right or wrong. However, I'm gonna leave it up to him because I wanna make sure he was paying attention. <laughs> so, the first question is, what percent of baby crocs die off in the first year? 80%. That's right. That's correct, can you come join me up here? Uh, okay. What is the potential result of global warming on the gender of crocs? In the back. I, I couldn't hear. Can you try again? Could you shout a little louder? Shout a little louder. She's given such a detailed answer, I, I think she must be right. Come on up here. Come on up, you're right. Do crocs see in 2D, 3D, or 4D? Do, do crocodiles see in 2D, 3D, or 4D? <laughs> He's got it, right? Where is, I couldn't hear. Over there. You said 3D. They see in 3D. That's you right. Got it right. Come on up. Come on up. All right. The terror croc lived 75 million years ago. How long was she? Uh, 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 right here. 37 feet. It's pretty close. I'll give it to you. What's the answer? 39 feet. Okay, come on All right, up. Pretty good. All right, come on up. What is the difference between a paleontologist and a biologist? $20,000 a year. <laughs> Anyone? Very noisy. That's right. Come on up. And our last question is, which has the greatest bite force? The largest American alligator or the largest saltwater crocodile? Behind us. Yes. Saltwater crocodile. Okay, come on up. Now, now it's time for the bite force challenge. Okay, I'm gonna ask a question, and the person that gets it right is considered the champ. They get to stand where I'm standing. Then they're gonna face off one by one and have a face off question between each person. Last person standing wins a prize. So, here, you wanna stand right up here? First question is, what is the bite force of the great white shark? Over there? 300? Yes. You're right, you're the champ, come right here. <laughs> now, you two face each other. Now this is when it gets really rough. Oh, he might bite you. <laughs> okay, next question. What is the bite force of a wolf? Yes. He's right. Okay, I'm sorry. You have to sit down. <laughs> All right, your next competitor. Sorry, John. What is the bite force of a lion? That's 900. Oh, oh. That's pretty close. They both got it. Who won? 
Remains our champion. I'm sorry, you're gonna have to take a seat. Next question. What is the bite force of a terror croc from 75 million years ago? What do you say? 1,100. Nope. Feet Almost. You got a hint for him? A little more than 20,000. 30,000. <laughs> a little less than 30,000. 23,000. There you go. Woo! Oh, All right. last All right. champ. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much for playing. Who's next? All right. You ready? Only one left. What is the bite force of a hyena for the win? Oh, they tied. She hit the buzzer. Come from behind. Come from behind victory. And for our winner, a scientific glass of Jolly Ranchers. Here's your question. For the audience, final question. What is the bite force of Rush Limbaugh? <laughs> I, I don't know what the answer to this one is. The human bite force. What's your, what's your answer? He doesn't bite, he sucks. <laughs> <laughs> we want to thank Paul Ginac for his visit. He did a great job. Can we give him a round of applause, please? Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, we want to thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, thanks to Val Lance Geffro and the Center for Communicating Science. Thanks to Paul, who is a the poster boy for the way to communicate science to the general public. And we want to hope that all our scientists at Stony Brook can reach us the way Paul has tonight. So a big shout out to Paul again. And thank you for thank you to the bench. And uh, we'll see you again. Good night and thanks for coming. That was great. Thank you. And to the band, of course, who went home.